So the last panel um, is going to be talking about Brexit and digital rights. So what is going to happen to the future of the digital economy, to our ability to enforce uh, fundamental rights. And we have two uh, panelists who come from kind of those two perspectives. So uh, we firstly we have uh, Mike Butcher, MBE, who is editor at large at Tent Crunch. He's been named one of the most influential people in European technology by Wired for five years running. He's a regular broadcaster. He founded the Europa's Conference and Awards. Uh, also the charity Tech Fugees and has been an advisor on startups to the British Prime Minister and the Mayor of London. Uh, speaking with him is Paul Bernal, who is a lecturer in information technology, intellectual property and media law at the University of East Anglia Law School and also a member of our advisory council. His first degree was in mathematics at Cambridge University. He has a, he's a qualified chartered accountant, has worked as an auditor in finance for big companies in the city, done pioneering work in the early days of the internet, including setting up and running the first online real-time education system for children to operate in the UK, has been finance director of a charity dealing with mental health and criminal justice. Uh, he's probably well known to a lot of you for tweeting and blogging um, about issues connected with privacy anonymity, human rights, and the internet. So without further ado. Hello, everyone. Um, my name's Mike Butcher. Normally, I'm um, on stage at the TechCrunch event talking about uh, uh, rapacious venture capitalists and uh, uh, who, who, aren't, who are very cuddly, really, but, you know, <laughs> they do have fair fun. And, um, and IPOs. So this is a, a new kind of experience for me. Um, but um, having been in the internet industry for a long time, I've Remember, I've done a lot of uh, events like this as well in the past. Um, I advised the Mayor of London on his first ever Twitter session. Uh, that was Boris. Um, and yeah, as you can imagine, it was a fairly odd scenario. Um, and, uh, and he types like this, two fingers. Anyway. Um, uh, and uh, so, Paul Bernal, you're a very eminent academic. You originally studied um, mathematics, so uh, you really definitely know your stuff at Cambridge. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about digital rights and how it's going to be affected by Brexit. But we're going to try and... Let's try, let's, well, obviously, we were chatting earlier and we we're going to try and um, make it interesting and f make it feel like you're kind of a bit better informed by the whole thing. But, um, you know, you've got basically surveillance and set censorship going on for the last few years in, in law and in the general history of UK governments. Um, you know, we were saying that one of the first issues that's going to happen with Brexit and our digital rights uh, is the technical stuff and the legal yeah. stuff, isn't it? Yeah. So what, what are the main points that are going to happen? Well, I, I think we... Uh, first of all, I'm not a very eminent academic. I spend a lot of time on Twitter making a lot of noise, but I'm not a very eminent... Don't believe him. Ac ...academic. Um, I think there, there, there are several sides to this. But the, the, the most important thing to understand is that we don't understand what's going to happen with Brexit. And that's even more true in relation to um, internet law, I think, than, than the other areas that we know almost nothing about what's going to happen with <laughs> Brexit. And uh, what's really important to understand, the reason that this, is, this matters is that most of our law concerning digital rights in, um, in the UK comes in some way from Europe. And uh, in most ways, there are a, a whole series of European directives that we're uh, dealing with. We have the beautiful timing of the reform of data protection law, the GDPR, which we will have to follow for a period of a few months, even if we leave when we leave when we don't. And then we'll have our own system immediately after that, just because the timing is complicated. And these are detailed, complex laws which are causing detailed, complex problems. And at the same time, there's more European law being reformed. We have um, the e-privacy directive, which is currently undergoing uh, reform and maybe being reformed in a way that does protect our digital rights, except that we won't get it. Because we've... Leave. Because we will leave before that comes through, whatever, whatever happens. Now, I said May, and I heard a bit of a puff, puff, 
noise from someone in the audience, and I think that was an entirely appropriate poof, poof noise, because um, that's the other thing that's really, really true with almost all of this law, that, that our law does not protect our rights, our digital rights, adequately already, and that what's going to happen with Brexit is going to make it worse. Is it the case um, that um, there's a sort of cut-and-paste thing going on with... Because they're so busy with Brexit that the politicians will simply go, oh, well, we like that bit of European law, let's cut and paste some of that, and then we'll add a bit of MI5 and MI6 into it, and off we go. How about that? No, partly. I mean, I, I think it's worse. Simplistic journalistic that, that, question, I know. Simplistic journalistic analysis, but it's pretty accurate, except I think the situation is actually even worse than that. I mean, we cut and paste bits, and the, the new data protection bill that is currently kind of sort of going through Parliament in a, in a kind of sort, of sort of way, has tried to copy what was in, what's in the GDPR, but has added a few little extra bits to make it worse. And I, I'm sure people will have seen the recent stuff going on about um, the use by immigration services of data, effectively bypassing data protection if they're doing it for, for enforcing immigration law. In what um, way is it making it worse? Well, it's making it worse because they're bringing in their own kinds of little exceptions to, to, what's, to what's there. And the little exceptions are written in such a way that they can be taken in different directions. And what we have in the UK, historically, is a series of laws that the authorities m use in ways that they weren't intended and stretch them further. What, however they're written, they will be taken a step further. And if you add a bit of vagueness then that vagueness will be taken to the advantage of, it, of the authorities. Isn't it the case that this is the sort of thing that governments do anyway? And how, do our, how does our government compare to, to others? Um, it's, in most ways, probably worse. Uh, really? Uh, really. Uh, it is in most ways. But partly that's as a function of our intelligence services being more... Um, I'm trying to, struggling for, to find a word that would actually be appropriate here. Um, they're, they're, they're more enthusiastic about, su about surveillance than some, than, than some um, governments are. And that our, the relationship between our intelligence services and our state is a more complex one. Our state is generally more supportive of the intelligence services. We still think our spies are James Bond, and uh, whereas uh, other countries are rather more suspicious. Other countries around. had the Stasi yeah. and etc. Yeah. yeah, I mean, just, just to put it in perspective, my wife is Romanian and was brought up under, under Ceausescu. They have a rather different attitude to um, the operations of the state. There's no, than, there's than, no than, Romanian than James do. Bond? Um, there is no Romanian James Bond. Um, okay. Not that I'm aware of, anyway. Uh, but I, I think we have to see, see also that, that that covers all the areas that our, our state tends to want to do stuff that other states often don't. OK, we know that it's going to get very complex um, with, with Brexit and that, um, and that, you know, give them an inch, they'll take a mile. We know that. What's happened with, what happens with the... Uh, safe harbour agreement that used to be that was with the between the yeah. US and Europe, and now because we're leaving Europe, what do we what happens to us in that scenario? Well, this, this is this is one of the most interesting technical so, things. Um, let, by, by the way, let's just do a little skinny on what the safe harbour yes. agreement was, just just for yeah. those. For so, so, so just in, in broad terms, uh, data protection law. One of the, the, the principles is that you can't transfer data out of the place where data protection law applies to somewhere unless there is suitably good protection, adequate protection, in the place that you, that you, you transfer it. That's one of the pillars of, of the law. The Safe Harbour Agreement was an agreement between the European Union and the US that said if US companies sign up to the principles of this agreement, then it's okay for them to transfer data from Europe to the US. And that was all fine and, and dandy. And vice versa, right? And vice versa. That was all fine and dandy um, until Edward Snowden came along and, and so, showed us quite how bad the US surveillance was, and that which brought about a legal challenge to that by Max Schrems, who said, basically, Your, my Facebook data is going to the US. It will not be protected there because of the su surveillance of the US. And he won his case. And the safe harbour agreement was declared invalid. 
And they put into place a replacement called the Privacy Shield, which has been going for about a year and has uh, kind of sort fudged of it. fudged various different things and is still subject to challenge. The point about Brexit is it puts us in the same position in relation to the European Union that the Americans were before. Now, our surveillance state before didn't matter so much because we were within the, the remit of the, of the European Union. We were covered by data protection. There was no problem transferring data out and out, from us, out to us from, from Europe and from us to, to Europe. When we're out of the European Union, we, we're in the American position. We need our own version of the privacy shield that says you can transfer data to the UK because it will be looked after safely by the UK. The problem is our surveillance state is in almost every way just as bad as the Americans was, so therefore the reasons that the safe harbour agreement was declared invalid might well mean that our that data transfer to the, to the UK is found invalid. Now, the UK government has pretended this is not a problem by, because they pretend that the Investigatory Powers Act is not an intrusive surveillance law. <laughs> and uh, you, there are arguments to be had by this, <laughs> and there will be more arguments I to be had I want to come back to that second. So... Um, let's fast forward a, fit, a bit um, to, to this sunlit uplands of Brexit. Obviously, everything's going to be Shangri-La. Um, what, how are we going to get the data flows between us and Europe? Um, are we going to simply have to mirror them, and then, as you said, you know, they'll be annotated by the security services? Or, uh, uh, or, is, it, or is it going to be sort of reinvented somehow? Uh, they're, going to, they're going to try to mirror it, and that's what this new data protection bill basically does. Um, and to begin with, they will, it will work. Uh, this is my prediction. I'm predicting the future, which I'm very good at. Um, I have a terrible record in, in all these ways. Um, they will try to mirror it, and the, it will be accepted to begin with, and I suspect the European Commission will put up something equivalent to the, to the privacy shield and say everything's fine and dandy. It will then be challenged in, in the courts, and uh, it may well lose and be declared invalid, and then we'll go, ooh, and do another transition arrangement the way we did with the, the, the last time around. Challenged in which courts? Ours challenged or the EU? In, it will be challenged in the European Court of Justice, in right. the CJEU. But if we've left the European Court of well, Justice, will we care? I'm just being a devil's we, advocate. The answer is, it doesn't matter whether we care or not, because this, is the Euro, it's, this will be a decision of the Commission yeah. to, allow, to allow data so, to flow. What we say about the, the, the ECJ is neither here nor there. They will decide they can't send data to us. We can say whatever we feel like. The ECJ still has the right, because but, it's a European decision. But, Paul, I'm confused, because... Um, <laughs> Uh, because I was, I was told that Britain is open for business. And, um, and, and, uh, and as we all know, it is. London, uh, Sadiq Khan continually tells us that London is open for business, which is fantastic. Britain's open for business. And surely it's the case that the, uh, uh, those, uh, our, our fair leaders, our great wise leaders, <laughs> want us to for Britain to be open for business and, and that for data flows to flow freely, that in order for you know, eggs and ham and milk and, uh, to flow one way and cornflakes the other way, whatever it is, um, uh, Marmite, shall we say, exporting to the UK, to the, to, to the EU. It's hard to get Marmite in the, U, in the US for very similar reasons. Marmite. Um, and um, uh, and uh, so we want that to happen. So... Isn't there, there's this weird tension between Britain being open for business and what the, and the scenario in a few years' time, as you said, when the European Court of Justice says, sorry, chaps, your data protection isn't correct, therefore we're having a bit of trouble with the trade issue as well, what then? You've asked the right question. The problem is there isn't a right answer. And this is, this is the thing, that, that whenever anybody asks the UK government about this, they either ignore it or, or pretend it's not a problem or, or just imagine somehow that something's going to happen that will change it. And th there is one scenario which, which can make it work, and I, and I think they might be, might be gambling on this. Gambling on the fact that the, the idea that the rest of Europe will suddenly become just as enthusiastic about surveillance <laughs> as um, the UK is. 
in which case it would be okay for us to have this level of surveillance. It would not be considered intrusive, and therefore data would be allowed to flow. And that is not an inconceivable scenario. And, and uh, they may well think that this is the case, and there, there is a regular push to suggest that this is, this is the way things go. So as the pound falls to the level of the euro, so too their interest in investigative powers goes up. So we get grand, gradually get in, in sync with Europe, finally. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. I mean, I think they, we would like to say, uh, the, the we, uh, the, the Home Office would like to think that finally the Europeans will realise that it's right to have complete surveillance on everybody everywhere. Um, I'm not sure that it's quite going to go that way, but it's, it, it's an argument. I, I think there is, a, there is another thing, which is also the classic... Brexit argument that somehow we will find a way to muddle through, that actually we don't have a solution, but somehow things will be all right in the end. And it, it's a, it, from, from a legal perspective, it's a very hard argument to accept, but from a pragmatic one, it, it might well be. I mean, because in, in effect, that's almost what's happened with the privacy shield. It has not stopped data flowing to the US. It has not stopped Facebook working. It has not stopped any of these things that were the project fear of, 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 of the privacy shield bit going. But I don't think that's the whole story either. It's not okay to rely on these things not happening. And there will be companies that will, as in many of these Brexit scenarios, actually be moving some of their business outside of um, the UK. Yeah. They won't be having their data centres in the UK yeah. anymore just in case something happens. They won't be doing this bit of business. And th that's where this open for business bit really comes in. Yeah, in fact, I think, was it today or yesterday, uh, Apple is even looking at moving its, its billion, billion euro data centre out of Ireland. Yeah, and, yeah. and, and the, the problem with Ireland is that Ireland go through the UK in, right. in, in a lot of ways. And, and Ireland is, the, is, is probably going to be shafted more by Brexit even, by, even than, than, than we are, but that's another, just, uh, another story. Um, I, just, I just want to ask a really serious question, uh, which is that um, you know, a very, very big terrorist attack in Europe, they might well actually... Um, introduce many more powers very similar to Yes, and, and in France that's, that's, that's certainly um, been the case. Yeah. And it's, it, that, that I think it, it, in some ways, that's why I, I, I mentioned the scenario before, in some ways that's the scenario which it's kind of the, 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 the worst scenario because the evidence does not suggest that these surveillance methods actually do much to stop terrorism whatsoever and they do do a lot to reduce our digital rights and they do do a lot to to, to reduce freedom of expression. And I think this is, that this is the other thing that I want, want to talk about. That This is not just about data protection, and this is not just about privacy. And that's where I think we have to, to, to be the most concerned, really. Um, the historical record of the UK government in these areas is very bad. Um, and, well, everybody, anyone who's here will know, will, will know about that. And what Europe did is it added a kind of layer of, of resistance. Now, some of that resistance was simply bureaucratic resistance, that there are more procedures to go through. It takes longer to get laws passed and so on. And actually, just putting some more grit in the cogs to stop it working fast more can actually more help. More oversight. Well, not exactly more. Even more, more bureaucracy as well, as well as more, more, more oversight. More red tape. But more what? red tape. Red tape. If red tape stops a government doing something bad then that's actually good red tape. And I, and I think, I know that's something that many people don't, don't like to hear, but sometimes red tape really, really helps. And we have to face up to the fact that our government wants to do some bad things. And sometimes you have to take whatever method you can to stop those bad things. And sometimes that's bureaucracy, sometimes that's a court system that has another layer of protection. And this is where, where uh, uh, I think some of the other noises coming out of the Brexit team um, need to, to concern us as well. Because Theresa May used to say, I want to stay in the EU, but I want to get out of the European Convention of Human Rights. <laughs> and um, there have been noises that that's the next stage. First of all, we get out of the EU, then we withdraw from the Convention. And those, they, they offer two different layers of routes, routes to um, 
challenge overzealous governments. And if we get rid of one, that's one thing. If we get rid of the next, that's another thing. And I think we should expect them to push for that, particularly when they realize that the, all those European court rulings that they were so upset about are actually from the European Court of Human Rights rather than the European Court of Justice. Um, I think it's a serious question as to whether Theresa May actually knew the difference between the, 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 two, the two courts. I'm not, I, I'm not convinced. I, I used to think it would be impossible for her to really believe that, but I'm, I'm not, not completely convinced. But certainly when they talk about prisoners' votes and so on, they're not talking about that. And when you withdraw from the European Convention, you have another layer of protection gone and another set of rights that are... Um, but there is, on the other side, the fact that they've been unable to produce this British Bill of Rights that they've been promising for well over a decade now does suggest they might not be as, as, as well able to do this as possible. But I, I think do you they, think that, that there's a chance of a, a British Bill of Rights happening, as it were? That, that, would that be, once again, a, a copy and paste and then take out the bits they don't like sort of thing? Well, everyone asks that, and then they say, which bits don't you like, and they can't come up with anything, which is a, always a challenge. I, I, I'm, I'm cynical about it. I think when they need to, they'll do it, but in, until they do, they'll, they'll bluster a, around. But I, I, I want to I bring back to this point that the, the, the privacy point is only one side, and that privacy... I, I start off, started off as a privacy person more than anything else. Privacy is... The importance of privacy more than anything else is that it protects the other rights, that, it, that, that without proper privacy, you can't have proper freedom, freedom of expression, you can't have freedom of association and assembly, you can't have protection from discrimination and, 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 and all of that. And that's where I think we need to start to be more concerned about privacy, is to understand its relationship to all, to all the other the other rights. And our government likes to get rid of both. And, and, and I'm sure age verification and things like that may seem like it's great in terms of protecting the kids and blah, 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 blah. But in the end, it becomes a way to identify individuals that then can be used against them in, in various different ways. And it creates a chilling effect that people feel nervous about going to the, the, the sites where they might which might be viewed as suspicious by other people, and that reduces all kinds of ways that we operate. And Luck luckily, many of those people will probably be future politicians, but um, <laughs> what about... Uh, we know that what the government's doing, what about the private sector? While all of this is happening, uh, the Facebooks, the Googles of this world, what would they be doing with their well, rights, especially during and after and I think I think there are several different, different angles to this as well, because this is one of the other areas that we haven't really thought about enough. In the past, the relationship between the UK government and the, um, the internet giants has been significantly cosier than the relationship between those internet giants and um, other European governments, and in particular by the, 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 the EU itself. So we tend to be very nice towards, historically have tended to be very nice towards Google, for example, and Google has been able to get more protection in law than they might otherwise. There was an example with the, the right to be forgotten a few years ago, which I know I, various people in the audience will disagree with me fundamentally about um, how it works, but what it did illustrate is the power of Google, because when the House of Lords was investigating the right to be forgotten, Google got a private hearing that, uh, uh, which the records of which are not still not made public to people, whereas everyone else did things in, in public, and the report that came out it might as well have been a Google press release, really. Um, and I'm shocked. Those kinds of relationships between the government and our government and the big companies are something that we should be concerned about. Now that is changing, and I think it's very interesting um, the, that Theresa May has been on the attack against the internet intermediaries, in particular. The "you've got to take down extremist material within two hours" comment she made um, about a month ago. Um, and the general sense that actually let's blame the internet companies for um, pretty much every social act of networks. terrorism, social networks in particular, generally, um, generally for, 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 for terrorism, for extremism, and for Google. pornography, and for, for, for every problem it's the internet intermediary's fault. And um, that, will, um, that will be on the minds 
of these companies. Now, from, 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 from the perspective of being open to business, that gives an incentive for those companies to move out of Britain. Or at least to move their, their um, data... To uh, move uh, certain out, elements right. of their business yes. out, of, out, of, out of Britain. Well, Google's just bought a very big building in King's Cross, so what are they going to do with that? Uh, well, we shall see. Um, maybe it's property speculation. Um, um, <laughs> But there, 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 are, there are two different incentives because there's also this idea that maybe we will be um, an island all on our own and actually they're going to have to... Liberland. Liberland. We will be the new Liberland and, and that actually companies will have to have their, their, their European data centres in Europe and their British data centres in, in Britain. So they're actually preparing for... for they might be preparing. Who knows? We, we, we'll, we'll find out. But uh, the relationship between us and the big companies, we, we will be... We will have less leverage over big companies as an individual um, state than we did as part of the European Union. Now, the European Union has been, in some senses, taking on Google for a number of years. And part of that is simply ge geopolitical stuff. They're American, we're European. The, the, we want a European Facebook has been something that various European commissioners have been talking about for many, many years. And it's had no result and will have no result. Um, so it's not, it's not that they're, they're, they're the good guys, but it does mean they're slightly less, more able to resist the pressure of the big Well, it's OK, because we we'll are. all be on V contact anyway, uh, <laughs> under, uh, eventually, which would be fantastic. Yeah. Well, um, uh, finally, I want to ask you quickly, and then before we can do some que cute questions, but what do you think concerned citizens can do if, they're, if they are concerned about anything? I'm afraid the real answer to that is very little. And I, I don't like to be um, depressing about it, but we're not in a position of being able to, to, to do very much. Continue to raise awareness of the subject is the, is the main thing. Write to, write to MPs. <sighs> Tweet at MPs. Yeah? Non, not in a non-harassing way. <laughs> being very careful about the language you, you use yeah. when, you, when, you, when you do. Um, I think we do need to work on our MPs. Um, uh, we need to work on our political parties. Mostly they've been very bad. Um, I have joined and left a number of political parties in the last few years, um, generally in protest against something awful that they've done in relation to, to um, the internet. I'm not a member of a political party at the moment. Um, but the political parties do matter. I mean, I, I just want to say we haven't actually mentioned um, her yet, but Amber Rudd... Ah, yes. <laughs> who, <laughs> who, who? Who is not just a, a, a pantomime WhatsApp? victim. I was going to mention WhatsApp, um, but more I was going to mention that, that um, what she has been saying in public matters. And, and what they say in private is, is another matter, and what they actually mean and what they put in the law and so on matter, matters to some degree. But what they say in public matters. So when Amber Rudd basically said, as she said, real people don't need encryption, I think was... Well, no, she said, real people don't need that kind of protection. Um, and she used the word real, words real people. Now, whether she actually meant it or not um, is, is only part of the, the story. The fact that she said that is putting a message out there that is trying to... to, are, to, to are politicians using WhatsApp groups to uh, either to protect each other from uh, claims about sexual harassment, um, real people, or, or to, to discuss it? Are they real people? Um, politicians are definitely real people. And, and, and it's funny, I've actually... The only times I've defended... Some, some of these, people are more these, real than others. Well, that's, their, that's certainly their, <laughs> certainly their view. I, 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 think, I think we shouldn't read too much in the, into their using WhatsApp. They use WhatsApp because WhatsApp's the stuff that we use. It's not, it's not that they have suddenly decided it's because it's got, got um, good encryption that they're going to use it. It's because it's what people use. And, and, and um, it's what my, my um, daughter, who is who's who's 11 years old, what she uses, because that's what the people in her group, her group use. So you use what you use. And the, what, that's, that has two points. One, it, it, it means that it's really important that we get those companies to do, to give us proper, proper privacy. It matters. Mm. Um, but, but also that we don't try to um, read in too much about, about any of these activities. Of course they talk about this stuff, and of course they use it. And the reason that I get so angry about them saying, oh, this terrorist used WhatsApp just before he did this, well, of course he did. 
Because he, he's a person and people, will, people use, use WhatsApp. We have to stop thinking that the internet is something that's used... But, it, it, but the point about the, the WhatsApp messages that were used particularly before the London Bridge attack was that... Uh, the, uh, the Westminster Bridge attack was that uh, they couldn't see the content of the message, whereas if it had been an email, maybe or an SMS, perhaps. That was the argument. That, it was the argument, and it is, the argu it, it is always the argument. And, and, and it's, it is the argument in favour of total surveillance of all people at all times and uh, is, is one that is used by people to do so. But it has so many downsides out of proportion to the potential benefits. And the uh, GCHQ, when you, when you talk to them, they care much more about the metadata than the content. Yeah. They know that that's what matters. The gold dust was what, what one of the, the GCHQ operatives... Because it's harder to lie in your metadata. Because metadata is structured in a way that you can, you the, can, the, you can analyse the it. The yes. When the message was sent, where it was sent from, etc. All that kind of stuff. Who what, it's sent to. Who it's sent to, how it's sent, what device you're using. All, the, all these kinds of stuff you can get from the metadata. The content. People lie in the content. People use... Or they use code or, or use code yeah. word. they, they, they code can do words. all kinds of stuff in 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 the content the metadata is more useful and they've got that that's not a not a not okay. a problem whereas protecting individuals privacy in other are, ways are you is suggesting that they that this is really just a, a straw man used by politicians the the content wanting to access the content of all of these messaging is a is a straw man used by politicians to divert our attention away from other I matters? I think it's a mixture of two things. There is a certain straw man element to it. There's also a certain ignorance element. What well, I mean as long as you that, use the right hashtags, though, isn't it? Uh, the necessary hashtags, yes. I, 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 think, I, think, I, think, I think there's part of it is that, that they, they think in old-fashioned terms. Now, in old-fashioned terms, reading content or listening to phone calls is more intrusive. And the number of politicians who immediately after the Snowden revelation said, I mean, Obama said, we're not listening to your phone calls. Um, William Haig said, we're not reading your emails. All, the, all this kind of stuff. Because they think that's a reassuring message and because they care more about whether people are listening to their phone calls or reading their emails, because partly they simply don't understand actually what's the useful use of stuff. So, so part of it is just ignorance. Part of it is a straw man stuff, part of it is just saying what they think people will... Will they be, be able to claim ignorance by. by 2022? I mean, come on, really? Well, you know, uh, a week ago, I thought some of the um, sexual harassment stuff that they talked about was stuff that we'd forgotten about that, that was out of date in the 80s. Um, I, I think we should, should never underestimate... Um, the amount of the, the potential for ignorance and claiming claiming stuff. It's, it's, mm. I think people live in a very different world. Right. Well, on that upbeat note, um, thank you very much, Paul, for uh, coming. Um, I think, how long have you got for questions? 15, 15, 20. Question over there, there, there. Go for it. Um, I'm an e resident. Have a stand up. Oh. Yeah. I'm an e resident of Estonia, kind of out of interest, because I think it's a really intriguing um, idea. Security. Can... Security. <laughs> I think it's a really intriguing idea that Estonia it has identified that why should residency be associated with land, um, and they, they don't kind of believe in land, uh, roughly. Um, do you think that's going to play any part in the future of, uh, well, all this stuff we've just talked about? Countries offering each other. Uh, like new rights that you don't need to actually be in that country for. Estonia. It, it, it's a, um, Estonia is very interesting from, from that perspective. I, th I think there are two sides to it. One, one is, one works in favour of it, one works against it. The, the, the technology could allow that kind of thing in, in, in many ways that it, that it um, used not to. But we also have this strong pressure towards um, actually narrowing things down, controlling people more within their, their areas, forcing you to... Um, Russian content must be, served, must be stored on Russian servers and, 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 and so on. And I, I don't know which way it's likely to go. I do know that the UK will resist any, any, any moves like that fairly massively. And I, I suspect that from our perspective... I mean, this, this business of the immigration authorities being able to have an, uh, effectively a bypass for, for, of data protection 
it's primarily to stop people like you. I mean, that's, that's actually part of the point. The point is to identify not people who are illegal immigrants, but people, people who might be. How can you determine who might be? You profile them, work out where they might be from, and then you can bypass the system. So, so pattern recognition. There are all kinds of different ways they could do it. And the point is that the way the law is likely to be written, and, I, and we'll see how it, how it goes through, um, it will leave enough openings for them to, to create an intention. If this is being done for this purpose, whatever tool you use for that purpose will then be acceptable. And again, we have a strong historical record of using tools that were not even around at the time when the laws were created and shoehorning the law to fit around it and saying that's OK. Uh, I think the fascinating thing about uh, the e-residency uh, thing with Estonia is that because of the incursion of Russia and the, the first cyber war was effectively against Estonia against, by Russia in 2007, it was, was basically to create more Estonians than actually live in Estonia. So that if the Russians do invade, and actually they're genuinely worried about this, that, um, that there would be more Estonians, as it were, outside of Estonia. Um, and in fact, now there, I think that this is a, an idea whose time has come. Kazakhstan is even looking at this at some point. So I know about your, your question, so we'll come to you in a second. We'll just take this one up here. Uh, excuse me, gentlemen. Um, regarding the, the, you know, the subject of the debate, um, is this really a moot point when we consider that uh, Agenda 2030, the UN agenda, yeah, um, envisions, and that's what they're working very, very hard at uh, achieving, is to have a global grid where everyone is, you know, surveilled 24-7, because with the Internet of Things, everything will be interconnected, so they will be able to know exactly what you're doing, when you're doing it, and where you're doing it. Do you know about that one? Um, I do. Um, I have to admit a little bit of cynicism um, um, about it. Um, but there, 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 are, there are several points. I mean, this is in some ways the Scott McNeely, um, you have zero privacy anyway, get over it. Um, yeah. and, and, and it's a, it's a continual argument that basically privacy is dead, we may as well give up on it. Um, I, I, I disagree with that, not just because it's something that I, I would like to be true. I, I would like privacy not to be, to be dead. But because I think we... we have to resist it, and in some ways we have, again, two different directions of, of, uh, of movement. We have the technology that's giving us less privacy, and we have the technology that's allowing us to avoid that less privacy. So we have, um, it's much easier do to you, get... Do you think um, that, um, that there's an economic uh, imperative here, that um, people who can afford privacy, people who can afford... Yeah to, um, uh, you know, pay monthly fees for VPNs and, and what have you, that, that, that they will yeah. I mean, it's, it's, buy privacy. It's one, it's one of the many digital divides um, the, the, that actually privacy is something that we, we, pay, we, we pay for. And this is where, again, I get back, back to the WhatsApp thing. The point about WhatsApp, the point about things like this is that the mass stuff that is effectively free, effectively free, um, I, we can talk about that uh, uh, in, in, to, to a great, great extent. Um, that, Free that, if you serve ads or something. Yeah, the, 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 the um, default position that people, that ordinary people can use is what matters. We need to make sure that, that protection is, yeah. is, is getting high. But to get back, to, get back yeah. to that at this point, should we give up because there is an agenda? I think we should... should, 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 should we should give up, but the, the, the major problem yeah. Yes, yeah, sure. But we, we, we shouldn't we, give up. I, I should say we. Yes, but things have been planned for a long time, I and mean, there was the, a big, big fear about the ITU taking over the internet about um, four or five years ago, and actually they're a pretty useless bunch of of, of no. um, they're not talkers do it. who are not going to be able to do anything in reality. And I suspect I may be being too optimistic that the same is true. Um, in this case, I, I think we have too many pressures from a nationalistic perspective to allow the international cooperation to work fully in that way. I, 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 I may be wrong about that. I may be completely wrong, but I'm, not worried. I'm, I'm much more worried about other things than I am about that.
I like, I'm sure the ITU like their jobs far, in Geneva far too much to bother with the internet. Carry on. In your former department, the maths department at the University of Cambridge, seminars are now available for maths and computer science students to learn ethics so that they might think twice about um, becoming employees of surveillance organisations, etc. Um, as a, an academic, are you working interdepartmentally within your university or across universities to engage with maths and computer science students to raise awareness of ethical issues? Because in those disciplines, so far, ethics training has traditionally not been a compulsory part of the program. Yeah, great question. Yeah, yeah very good question. And I, I, I should say um, the answer to that is yes, we are. Um, I've done, uh, we have a, a, within our university, we have a forum, a data ethics forum that includes people from, from various different departments, political science and law and, and computer sciences. It is, however, a small talking shop, not something much bigger than that. But there is an awareness of the subject um, increasingly. Um, that's true in many universities. However, I'm, I'm slightly wary of the data ethics subject because sometimes people learn about the data ethics to learn the language of data ethics so they can explain what they're doing in a way that makes it sound acceptable. Okay. I, again, I may be somewhat cynical about that, Quick. but that's what I've seen. Next question, right there. Should we become a third country and in the process not adopt or reject the Charter of, uh, Charter of Fundamental Rights? Um, there was discussion earlier about whether a British Bill of Rights could, um, could potentially give the protections which the EU would require uh, of citizens within a country deemed adequate. Um, but we're in a position where we can't pass a basic, base, basic law or a fundamental law because of parliamentary sovereignty. Parliament can always change its mind. Would you like to comment on, on, on that? <laughs> yeah, this is a big constitutional law question and, and one of the many things that's been, that we, we've been talking about in our law department for a long time is would we be better off with a written constitution? And I think the arguments go, go both ways. I, I, I'm, I'm not convinced that parliamentary sovereignty um, is either as good as, the, as its supporters would like or as bad as its, as its opponents would, would say in this way. I don't think that we can think in terms of fundamental rights in those ways in the UK generally. I think we have to be more pragmatic. And I, 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 pragmatism from lawyers is a very... Um, it's an ethical question sometimes. Should, 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 we be, should we be thinking on those terms or should we be thinking more, more fundamentally? I don't think we can think fundamentally in the way things work in, in the UK. Two reasons for that. One is that actually changing it is not a practical proposition, even in the medium term. We're not going to get out of, out of that situation. And um, secondly, that, that the problems we have are immediate and changing. So if we try to set in place something, and, and this is where I, some, I, I keep changing my, my view of things like fundamental digital rights um, declarations and things like that because the rights that we we claim may not be the rights that we need even a few years few years down the line if we're too specific and if we're not specific enough they're harder to make and make at all at all meaningful so it's not as easy to to get these sort of sort of thing to work as we'd like what i would like is something that can pragmatically protect at least some of our rights now we're in a fundamentally difficult situation at the moment particularly because of the way that we have effectively handed over our privacy, freedom of expression, association, assembly rights, and so on, to social networks and search engines. Because, frankly, almost every meeting we do is organized through this way or, or another. Now, I'm not saying this is necessarily a good thing or necessarily a bad thing, but it makes our control over those things much, much harder. And the one thing I would not want to do is to put that into the hands of the government. I would not like the UK government to have detailed control over the, the, the way that we use things like Facebook and, and Twitter, however much they want to. Okay, final questions, everybody. If you've got a last question, they've got one there. Anyone else? Okay, and one there. Okay, those will be the last two. Go for it. Uh, 
Thank you. A quick, par a quick question parallel to what Brexit might mean for digital rights. Um, what does the European Union's um, issues with different corporation taxes, especially as they affect large web companies such as uh, Apple and Amazon, um, how will attempts to redress this across the European Union affect digital rights uh, of those using those companies? Uh, like That's as much for you as it is for, for, like for me. Tax bills and things like yeah. that. Oh, yeah. It's very interesting the way that actually tax is one of the few, few things that unites countries in wanting to attack Google. Um, <laughs> And I and I and I I understand why why it does, but um, after Brexit, the likelihood is we're going to try and lower our taxes to attract the business that we've lost for all those many other other reasons. Could we compete with Ireland? I I think it's it's likely that we may try in some ways, but has Ireland's competition worked? It's they, not. The it's, revenues are up, but I, I wonder, in the case yeah. of Brexit, um, if we're a third country, um, what benefit would there be for these large web companies to have their bases here? Harrods. <laughs> I, 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 I'm joking a little bit, but actually, I, I, it is one of the main appeals for being in Britain is that Britain is currently a a, a, a nice place to be if you are of that sort of a sort of a class but you may uh, you may want to base your corporation somewhere else but your executives will want to be somewhere that they think is nice house prices great schools all fantastic that stuff. stuff they um, like they think it is even if it's um, not, property um, property property go ahead uh, I have a question about the digital single market directive in particular article 13 the upload um, the content filtering um, and isn't that essentially the EU? I mean, notwithstanding that maybe the individual states might not be as enthusiastic as the UK government in terms of surveillance, but isn't the EU, with Article 13 under the guise of protecting copyright holders, essentially outsourcing a very intrusive form of surveillance to internet companies? And if Brexit does happen, would, I mean, what do you think would happen in terms of the UK? Would we adopt that or... Do you think we take a different direction? So uh, is there a crossover between surveillance and copyright? Very much, very much. much. There, there absolutely is. And there, but there have been a number of European court rulings that have largely been, um, I don't know if it's to say largely, at least in, some of them have been positive in relation to protecting us against surveillance for copyright, copyright purposes. Um, my instinct is that we'd be just as bad or not, if not worse, if we left the European Union, because our creative industries lobby in the UK is a very powerful one, and in some ways is as powerful as any of the, the ones in, in Europe. And I'm, I, I'm not optimistic in the sense that I, I suspect that we, will, we would go along with that and maybe even do it worse. I'm, I'm, again, what, sorry, when I say worse for anyone in the creative industries, I love the creative side. I'm not quite so sure about the industry, <coughs> industry side of, of, of that thing. I think the, the proportionality of, of the, the, the way we deal with it, we're likely to, do, um, to be leaning in the direction that I think is the wrong yeah, direction think, to lean. Yeah, I think you're right. And also, traditionally... Um the, uh, the lobby, lobby groups on behalf of music industry in particular, uh, movie industry, of course, BAFTA, etc., uh, are always way on the high side of the big studios and the big production houses and the big yeah. mu record labels, etc. And, the, you know, the content mixers and the creatives and the small, small indie hot shops, etc., they always have, have troubles. And then, but that, interestingly, that would probably mean that, that they would side, therefore, on the big... You know, um, you know, IP, you know, producers like Netflix, um, Apple, iTunes, um, Spotify, and and you, you know, forget trying to be a startup in that space, basically. Okay, last question. It's a great country, but it has a bloody difficult, bloody difficult leader in her own words. And what is the credibility of the UK in negotiating a Brexit deal? Do you think that a deal <laughs> will be ever made to begin with? Because credibility-wise, we lost it all. <laughs> you got me. <laughs> this is probably what I spend more time tweeting rubbish about than, than, than anything, anything else. Um, 
And by the time we finish this speech, she may not be leader anyway. Who knows? Things, things are changing. Let me just check the news. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think uh, I, it's anyone's guess what the deal situation will be. I have people telling me vehemently, well, we've had cabinet ministers vehemently telling us that no deal is, is inconceivable, and others saying no deal is, uh, we're, we're actively preparing for no deal. Um, in relation to digital rights, I think they, whatever happens, they will be looking for um, data protection adequacy, they will be looking for data flows to be possible, regardless of whether we have an official deal or not. I, I don't think that the, that the digital area is the area where, where our failure to get a deal is going to be the biggest problem. That's my, that, that's my, my instinct. I don't think it's... I, I, I think even this government is not stupid enough to think that we can survive without data flowing between the UK and Europe. Exactly. And <laughs> because remember, everybody, Britain is open for business. Right. I just want to say thank you so much. I appreciate that, Paul. Thank Please you. Come around.